Assalamu alaikum. Dear learners, I hope you are fine. In the previous lecture, I talked about various transmission mediums that can be used for routing the signal once it has been acquired from the sensor and has been processed a bit. In this lecture, I will continue the discussion of previous methods used for routing the signals from one device to the other device. Moreover, in the later half of this lecture, I will also talk about the reliability of the systems that are implemented in industrial setups to ensure that even if some instrument was faulty, the whole system doesn't suffer because of that. Therefore, I have divided this lecture in two parts and in the first one, I'll discuss things related to different systems and architectures that are used for signal transmission. Whereas in the later half, I'll discuss various safety features and related concepts. We have discussed in some earlier lecture that what is an intelligent or a smart instrument. Just to revise, an intelligent instrument is one that has three basic characteristics. These are the processing capabilities, the communication capabilities, and the diagnostic capabilities. Now, if in an industrial setup or in any other real life, a number of instruments are installed which are intelligent, they need to communicate various pieces of information with each other. Such a scenario is known as distributed control system or for short DCS. This kind of system doesn't have any central processing unit, but what is happening is that all the devices are performing some kind of processing and they are modifying the signal before routing it to any other device that needs that information. The main advantages of using a distributed control system are that you can easily add more computational power into the whole system without disturbing it. Because as the whole system is distributed and individual instruments are not fully dependent on other instruments, therefore adding or removing of some of the instruments is not a problem. The next advantage can be derived from this point, that is, if any instrument fails, the whole system will keep on working. This thing is called fault tolerance. That is, this system can tolerate certain types and magnitude of faults and will keep on working even if there is some instrument that has malfunctioned. Lastly, there is no centralized computer control or a processing unit. Therefore, dependency on some central processor is completely gone over here. These type of systems are called redundant systems. That is, even if something fails in them, the other instruments will fill in the gap and the whole system will keep on working with a reasonable performance. Now, as we have established that there are a number of devices, in fact, the intelligent devices that are going to communicate with each other, then there should be some kind of an electronic highway over which the data should be routed. This electronic highway should make sure that the data reaches its desired destination and there are no collisions between different data packets. Other than the information bits, the electronic highway should be capable of routing or carrying control bits along with the data. These control bits are the backbone of the whole communication channel because these will indicate the connected devices that what kind of data is coming their way. You can consider control bits as indications that the information is coming towards any device and also for the indication that information has ended. You can relate this thing with the way you communicate with your friends. If you want to talk to your friend over telephone or mobile phone, a ring on your friend's mobile phone will notify him that your friend is calling or you are calling. Once your friend accepts the call, the communication channel will open and information will start flowing from you to your friend. And once your conversation has ended, you will say some ending words, which will indicate to your friend that now you are going to cut off the communication channel or the call. Similarly, two devices will communicate with each other in this fashion. The control bits will tell the receiving device that some information is going to come. Then the information is received by the receiver and at the end there are more control bits that tells the receiver that information has ended. I have explained this thing very generically. Normally there are specific type of control bits associated with different phases of communication. 
I'll talk about these things in a bit more detail after a few slides. As the world has progressed, we are moving more and more toward digital system. And most of the latest developed communication techniques are focusing on digital communication. However, we still use a number of devices that are producing analog signals. So we need to route those signals as well. But to limit the use of the analog signals and to fully utilize the digital communication channels, the analog signals are routed from the analog signal producing devices to some nearest processor or a node where it is converted into a digital signal and then that digital signal is routed in the digital communication channel. Whenever some communication is going to happen, you have to follow some protocols. Otherwise, a proper communication cannot be established. You can relate this thing with you talking to your friends or talking to your teacher or talking to your parents. In all these cases, the communication protocols are different. You will not talk to your friend like you talk to your teacher or your parents. Or you will not talk to your teacher as you talk to your friend. Similarly, for devices to communicate with each other, there are certain protocols. And I will talk about these protocols in a bit. Over there, I will discuss that how analog and digital communication systems are still surviving with each other. But before discussing that, let me discuss the electronic highway that I talked about in the previous slide that what kind of electronic highways are normally used. Primarily, there are three highways, namely the serial communication line and the parallel databases and a local area network. A local area network can utilize serial communication or parallel database. You can think of the local area network as a large network of roads in which some roads are multi-lane roads, whereas the others are single roads. Talking about the serial communication, this kind of communication has relatively slow data rates, but they can operate at much larger distances than the parallel databases. You can easily achieve a communication distance of up to three kilometers by using simple copper wire links, whereas for achieving much higher distances, telephone lines, radio telemetry, and sometimes fiber optics are used. The serial communication link has a characteristic form in which only one line is used to transfer the data. Therefore, in the most basic form in serial communication, only one bit at a time is transferred. Normally, starting bits and ending bits are used to notify the receiver about start and end of the data. Serial communication has three different forms. The simplest one is called simplex. In this form, only one device can communicate with the other, whereas the reverse is not possible. An example of this is a simple thermometer that you are using to measure the temperature of the room. The temperature sensor can tell you the temperature by generating some signal, but you cannot communicate with the temperature sensor or tell it to do anything. The next form the serial communication can take is called the half duplex. In this form, there is one line through which two devices can communicate. But there is a condition that only one device can speak and the other can listen at a time. An example of this is a simple walkie-talkie that you might have used as kids. In that, only one person can talk and the other can listen. And once the first person has stopped talking, the other person can open the channel and speak, whereas the first one will listen. Another example of half duplex communication is the ethical way of talking to anyone. By this, I mean that whenever someone is talking, the others should listen. And whenever someone else has to speak, he should ask for permission and then speak so that the others can listen now. The last type the serial communication can take is called the full duplex. In this form, there are two separate lines used for sending and receiving data. For example, one device can use line number one to send data to device number two, whereas device number two will receive the data from line number one. And similarly, device two will use a second line to send data to device number one, and device number one will receive the data through line number two. In this fashion, both devices can talk to each other at the same time without their data being mixed. However, a single line can also be used to establish a two-way channel by using 
signal modulation techniques that we have studied in the previous lecture. An example of this kind of communication is your telephone lines or your mobile communication. Specifically, in telephone lines, there is only one line that carries voltage, whereas the other act as a reference. You also know that while talking on telephone landlines, person at both ends of the telephone can talk at the same time and the signal will not mix with each other. This is because both telephone sets are using different kind of modulation to route the signal through the telephone line and hence both signals doesn't mix up. The same thing is happening in mobile communication where you and your friend both can talk at the same time and the signals will not get mixed up because both of your signals are being modulated using a different carrier signal. Moreover, there are two different modes of data transmission that are used for serial communication. These modes are the asynchronous and synchronous modes. As the name suggests, the asynchronous communication means that both the transmitter and the receiver, they are not in complete sync with each other. A perfect example of this kind of communication is an email that you send to your friend or your teacher. The email will contain your information and whatever you want to say to your friend, but your friend will not check or is not obliged to check and reply as soon as he receives the email. Although the email inbox will notify him that there is some incoming message, but he will open that email whenever he will find time. And similarly, when he will check the email, he will reply to it and you might check that email one or two days after the reply has been received. So the point over here is that in asynchronous mode, both the transmitter and receivers are doing their own job and they are not in sync with each other. So that when transmitter transmits something, receiver does not necessarily receive that thing immediately. In more technical words, we can say that the transmitter and receiver are working on different clocks and the transmitter will have to transmit some start bits, stop bits, parity bits and few other type of bits to notify the receiver that something is coming its way. Most probably, the receiver will then send back a signal that whether it is ready to receive the information or not. And if the receiver is ready, only then the transmitter will transmit the information. On the contrary, in the synchronous mode, information can flow from transmitter to receiver without any kind of intimation because both transmitter and receiver are in complete sync with each other. To open the communication channel in this kind of data transmission, only a request is sent from the transmitter to the receiver to open the channel. And once the receiver opens the channel, the communication starts flowing without any need for start or end bits. Particularly, in this case, the transmitter and receiver are working on the same clock, that is, they are in sync with each other. Only at the end, the transmitter will have to send a goodbye message or something like that that will tell the receiver that the information has ended. As this type of communication is continuous, Therefore, it is much faster than asynchronous data transmission. An example of this kind of communication is live video conferencing, where whatever your friend has to say, you will listen to it as soon as your friend speaks. And the same thing will happen in the reverse direction. Now, you don't have to wait for your friend to listen to what you are saying and then reply at some later time. Simple serial communication or parallel communications are fine as long as there are only two devices. But if there are more than that, you need some kind of a network. Normally, this thing is called local area network. This is a network of local devices which can communicate with each other using a defined protocols and rules. Normally, LAN networks transmit data in digital form using serial transmission lines and synchronous transmission. However, some devices in LAN networks might use parallel databases as well. The most famous protocols for synchronous serial transmission are RS-422 and RS-485. 
RS-422 is the same protocol that is used by your computer to communicate with the internet router if you have connected the router through a LAN cable. Moreover, RS-485 is a similar kind of a protocol but is used mostly in industrial setups to establish communication between different devices. Parallel databases are normally not used in this kind of networks because of their high cost, problem of signal attenuation, and noise induction and limit of distance to which data can be communicated using parallel wires. If you are going to connect certain number of devices in a network, then that network should have some structure or architecture. There are numerous type of architectures that are used for LAN networks, but the most famous ones are the star network, the bus network, and the ring networks. I'll discuss these three networks briefly in the next slides. This network got its name from the shape it has. In this kind of a network, there is a central processor or a central network administrator to which all devices are connected. Therefore, if any two devices have to communicate with each other, then the information has to flow through the central processor. The advantage of this kind of network is that you have a complete control over the data which is flowing in the network wires from the central location. Whereas the downside of this kind of network is that if the central computer goes down, everything goes down. Normally in organizations, internet is provided using this kind of network. You might have experienced that if your central network controller goes down, the internet or the connectivity of the whole organization goes down. The next type is called the bus network because it utilizes a central bus which is powered by a separate power source. Additionally, there is a controller attached to this bus which allows different devices to communicate or use the bus for communication with each other. As there is only one central bus over which the information from all the devices is going to travel, there is a need for some contention protocol that will manage the traffic on this highway. Therefore, it is the job of the controller to manage this traffic. This kind of network has the disadvantage just like a star network. That is, if the central controller goes down, then everything will stop. Because over here, if the central controller goes down, no two devices can communicate with each other because no one knows that what is the condition of the highway and whether it should send data through the highway or not. However, in this case, the data is not being routed through the controller, so you won't have the central control in this kind of network architecture. Moreover, the central controller in this case is much more rugged and simple device. Therefore, chances of its failure are quite low. The last type of architecture is called the ring network. The network got its name from the way the devices are connected to each other. All the devices are connected to central circular bus and they can communicate with each other directly. Moreover, to limit the traffic or to avoid any collision between the data packets, token passing method is normally employed in these kind of systems. The token passing method gives a token to a particular device and if that device has to communicate something, it can communicate while it has the token. After a particular time, the token will move to the next device and at that time, the next device can communicate. So whichever device has the token can send the data through the central circular bus. This ensures that no two devices can send the data at the same time on the bus, hence avoiding any kind of collision and contention. At the start of the lecture, I talked about that there are protocols which are being used to handle both kind of information transfer, that is the analog and the digital. Because we are still using analog devices and we need to route those analog signals through the networks. This protocol is called HART protocol which stands for Highway Addressable Remote Transducer Protocol. In fact, it is an interim protocol which is being used in two different modes. One mode supports both the digital and analog communication, specifically for devices which generate analog signals. The signals from these devices are routed using 4-20 milliampere signal, whereas the control signal in, is in the digital form. 
The second mode of this hard protocol is called the fully digital mode. In this mode, the devices are able to communicate through fully digital signal. However, the speed of communication is lesser than other fully digital protocols. Hard protocol is employed in a setup where both analog and digital devices are working. However, if you have only digital devices or there are processors that can convert analog signals into digital ones, then you can use more specialized digital communication protocols. Fully digital protocol has a generic name field bus. This generic name encompasses a range of high speed bus based network protocols that support two way communication in completely digital format between several intelligent devices connected through a local area network. Field buses have no room for analog signals. Therefore, if analog devices are being used, then their signal should be converted into digital form before they can be routed through the field bus. The major advantages of field bus based systems are faster system design, easy and fast commissioning, reduced cables, easier maintenance, and hence reduced installation and maintenance costs. Moreover, as intelligent devices are connected with these field buses, they are capable of automatic fault diagnosis and these buses offer flexibility to replace the instruments easily. A number of manufacturers are manufacturing instruments that follow same kind of field bus protocols. So if any instrument from one manufacturer malfunctions, then you can easily replace it with an instrument from another manufacturer who is manufacturing the instrument using the same field bus protocol. Although there are a number of advantages of field buses, the practical problem associated with them is non-standardization. Almost every major industrial country or a manufacturer has its own field bus. For example, manufacturers from Germany will most probably sport Profibus, whereas from France they will sport World FIP. And in Denmark, they normally follow PNET protocol. Whereas in the United States, Loneworks, DeviceNet, and IEEE 1118 field buses are being used and manufactured. And in the UK, Millbus is mostly produced and used. Apart from these field buses, specific devices or the systems also use different kind of buses. For example, most of the automobile manufacturers use CAN bus protocol whereas Interbus S and SDS field buses are also used in different kind of devices. And if we talk about industrial robots, then EtherCAT is the most used protocol. Standardization of field buses has been attempted quite a lot of time, but the world couldn't agree at one standard field bus protocol. In 1996, the European Union agreed on using a combination of Profibus, World FIP and PNAP to form a standard name EN50170. However, the Field Bus Foundation proposed a much broader standard protocol titled as IEC 61158, which have been revised and updated from 1998 to 2014. But still, there are manufacturers who are not following this standard. This was everything related to signal transmission systems that I have to say. And I hope that you have understood various concepts which I have tried to explain. And furthermore, it is recommended that you look into the details of various field buses that I have mentioned in this lecture. The next portion of this lecture will cover the topic of system reliability. Therefore, learners are recommended to move on to the referenced video for the second part of the lecture. Thank you and take care.